The Wii as a console is an interesting one to reflect upon, as its main control system, the Wiimote, had a design that could lend itself to many functions, while also being immediate enough to attract many people. So it was a good idea on Yasuhiro's wildest part to suggest Goichiro Suda, known as Suda 51, to put his sword game on the Wii. So No More Heroes is a game on the Wii, guy wants to be top assassin, wants sexual intercourse and wants revenge. He gets boss fights. In this review I'd like to focus less on the events of a narrative by recapping it, as there are videos that already do that and better than what I could have done, but what I'd like to focus more instead is seeing the No More Heroes through different lenses, hoping to find through a different perspective interesting stuff in its themes and aesthetics. And the first lens I'd like to see it through is the rope, along with a stick, are two of mankind's oldest tools. The stick to keep the bad away, the rope to bring the good towards us. But we're our first friends, our own invention. Wherever there were people, there were the rope and stick. Noah. So as I might have hinted, one reason I think this game did well is its function of serving as the sword game for the Wii, alongside the Red Steel, Skywardio, and Chambara from Wii Sports Resort. For the sake of the game, and my argument by extension, the Wiimote becomes a link between you, the player, and Travizio, the character as the Wiimote functions as an extract object that transforms in the many simulations on the Wii in every tool humanity has ever created. And without going too deep in semiotics, it can also be the people. When you suplex, you suplex with Travis. When you sword, you sword with Travis. When you kill, you kill with Travis. When you do the stimulation motion, you stimulate with Travis. As long as you hold that controller, you're one. What do you say, bro? Join me. Let's see how far we can take this. And for you there holding the Wii remote right now, just press the A button. Let the bloodshed begin. So his people is your people as well. And while following safety measures on the Wii, uh, you are literally tied together. <laughs> the thing is that, like the sword controls, which work by you giving the directions with motions and then executing it with buttons, Travis doesn't work as a self-insert character that much. Like, you may relate to him and he's the main character, but like, he's not you in the sense that you are giving him directions and making him do it. But in the end, he's deciding what he's doing, so it's more a story of individuality. And like, I wasn't trying to sound like a weird snob with that tangent about you not being Travis. <laughs> I, it's just the feeling that I got that it seemed intentional. It's like Travis and many other characters acknowledge the presence of the player at times, and in works where the main character talks to a public, usually there's a distinction. You're not supposed to be feel like you're the him. Anyway, the narrative of No More Heroes and Sexuality are heavily linked. Apart from being one of the motivation of a main character and final boss, it is also a constant theme throughout the story. And while the journey in the first game is to basically get big people, in the second one, Travis is already big people man, here represented by his sword, which as a weapon has always been heavily associated symbologically with phallic imagery. For a film apt for comparison, in this case I'd say the 1986 film Highlander, which talked about immortal sword fighters fighting to become the only one remaining and ascending, could work. It's got even Queen music, it's very nice. In a way more structurally similar to how the assassin brain fights work, one of the most interesting aspects to analyse for me in this film is the particular undercurrent imagery 
and plot points that makes it more about a journey of self-discovery of homosexuality. Like with it spending a lot of time talking about how these immortal men cannot have a relationship with women, how they are rejected by their communities and can only reach the climax when they fight between each other. You faggot Nash, why can't you feel you're cruising for a piece of ass? Uh, it's not subtle, but for the time it was something. Interestingly, even the katana wielding Sean Connery does a sort of initiation for the main character in a sort of ninja chigo fashion, not unlike it was done in the Meiji era, which is also alluded by Thunder of Youth dialogues. Autobiographical names. So, a big appeal of uh, 51 Sudato games at least for the people I know, is how earnest the writing can get. Like, characters can open up and bring a lot of real stuff out. This kind of thing manifests even in the game structure. Having to work part-time jobs to get the money to pay for what feels like big projects, which is the way certain creators do, usually. A lot of this real emotion of characters comes out in their encounters. They are life of death battles after all, so... And just as so I talk about in the Gundam influence media, you get the feeling that the person you're fighting has a life of their own, with ideals, traumas and aspirations. A life that will, though, end. And that is what the first two games made me think about. So now I'd like to talk about the Travis Strikes Again. The TSA. The TSA is an interesting work as it can work as a sort of mixed media project, not unlike In Memory and Level 5 by Chris Marker. Chris Marker is a French author who used fake names and identities that worked on a lot of different concepts. One of his most famous film, L'Age Deux, which was the inspiration for Mamoru Oshii's work and the plot of Twelve Monkeys, works with an interesting type of editing style that reminds of a transitions in mist to give an idea, let's say. So I cited Level 5 and In Memory for a reason, by the way, as TSA, which is about Travis discovering a discontinued console and finding about its author through their works, kind of mirrors these two projects. Level 5 is a film about a woman losing their loved one, who left the game they were developing before their demise, and then her trying to connect to and discover them one last time through their game. In Memory, on the other hand, is a multimedia project where Chris Marker basically filled a CD-ROM with everything he worked on his, in his life, creating a sort of crystallization of a psyche work of ideologies. All of this is to say that Travis Strikes Again, which contains tidbits from films, games, novels and even small droplets of personal wisdom, it's got Terminator stuff, it's got things that look like Sega Satan openings. It kind of works in the same way for me as a sort of earnest manifestation of Guichiro Suda's mind. As like you do when you control the Travis or how new types in the Gundam. <laughs> it almost feels that some aspects of your mind can align with someone. And even for just a moment, you can feel it. Yes. While we're here, I kind of wanted to talk about a film for a bit, which is Mamoru Oshii's Akai Megane, also known as The Red Spectacles, from 1987. This film, which is part of a Kerberos saga, alongside others like Jinro, is inspired by the Nouvelle Vague, which is, I think it's called French New Wave in English, and in specific films like L'Age Deux, alongside the student protests of the 60s in which Oshi participated alongside other creators like Hayao Miyazaki and has been a strong influence in many media products in Japan, which 
in turn kind of explains in retrospect the many French new wave-isms, even in the soundtracks of many shows like the Majong anime Shinseki Evangelion, and by extension many Akiu Vishimbo works, like to the point that he even dressed a character like the main character of the Red Spectacles in, his, in one of his shows, which is all referenced in the No More Heroes. Going off a further tangent here, there could be an argument to be made that Sun Goku Satsu, the raging demon, could be a reference to this film. Like, <laughs> this, this thing that gets going on right now, isn't it like the same thing? Like, doesn't it look like the same? Anyway, all of this brings us back to the No More Heroes. And while the animation inspirations are usually more explicit in the Gundam and Gunbuster ones, a part of the soul of this film is felt too. Like visually, the character of Henry Cooldown, for one, is wearing that fit, the famous fit of the uh, Akai Mege we mentioned earlier. And the heavy use of signs is not to be overlooked as this directional choice is prevalent in mostly Awashi's work. Like you can see it in here, in the Red Spectacles, but even in Ghost of Michelle, there's a lot. On the storyline aspects, the stories have some weird parallelisms that catch the eye such as the main protagonist's appreciation of ramen stunts owed by people who seem to have a shady past. A lot of monodirectional phone calls, the protagonist finding themselves defenseless in a specific point of a narrative, an obsession for a woman from the past, and even the returning to a never-changing town, and then the related feeling of a passage of time. And now, for the end of the video. E finalmente c'è il finale. <laughs> As you may have noticed, I do not have a major overarching point of normal heroes. What I wanted to do here, as I've said earlier, is see it and show you it in different ways. Because I find that some works of art and media usually are not telling just one story and are best appreciated by checking them out in different ways. So that's it. Postscriptum. So I didn't know where to put this, but there was one bit in the influence of a wreck spectacles that seemed worthy of a separate attention. So within the many media that reference the Kerberos saga, there's also Scooby-Doo, like the, the animated show, where there's an episode with robots who have a striking resemblance to the Panzer Corps armor. And there are even bits with Scooby and Shaggy wearing it. And I do not think it's a coincidence as there's like an episode in the series that references Higurashi. Uh, like the, when they, that, that, that thing. We're an old man disguised as a mere dog scoop. We're a wolf disguised as a man. Well, I'm just giving a wolf if we had only a dangerous human still. <laughs> <laughs> so, have a nice day. <laughs>